Except the Lord build a house, lay labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep this city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now notice the next verse. It is vain if you rise up early to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. That's the first and second verses of the 127 Psalm. You know what these verses say? They simply say that uh, man isn't big enough to do the job. That's what the verses say. It says man isn't sufficient. Now the trouble with man, he has always felt like he was sufficient. And you go back and read the story of the past. It's a story of houses that men built and houses that fell down. It's a story of empires that went up and empires that went down. It's a story of civilization and culture that went up and civilization and culture went down. That's the story of the race. Now the psalmist explains that with a pen of inspiration. He said the trouble is man did it. And man can't do it. He did it, but he can't do it. Man cannot build permanently. First place, man isn't here for long. You and I are on the stage of action for a little while. We play our little part and the curtain goes down and the show's over. They take us out and bury us. Just recently, I was over in western Alabama where I preached uh, 50 years ago as a boy, 18 years old. I drove around to the cemeteries and saw the tombstones. I remembered people that were buried there 50 years ago. A long, long sleep it's me out in the silent cemetery, the city of the dead. There were some birds singing around the trees. The little birds will soon be there. Winter's come and spring has come and summer's come and fall has come. Seasons have gone on. They've slept their silent sleep. Man is not here forever. Man cannot build something that lasts forever. He's not sufficient. There's only one person in this universe that's big enough to do it, and that's God Almighty. And poor, weak man hasn't had enough sense to trust God to do it. Now, it doesn't mean here, the psalmist doesn't mean that a man's not to do his part. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches that you're going to sit down and fold your hands and be a sluggard, not work. Doesn't mean that you sit down and let God hold the garden and plant the corn. And let God gather in the harvest for he doesn't mean that. It just means that you without God, you're a failure, that's all. No man, unless he's in contact with God, has ever been a successful man. Outside of God's power and blessing, there is no success. It's always faith. It may look like success. You may see a man that accumulates money because he has talents and ability that God Almighty gave him. But man, in the very accumulation of wealth, is making a failure if he's not right with God. If you are not properly related to God Almighty, you can't succeed in this world. Strange how men look at things. I'm talking to you now along the line that uh, some of these worldly wise big boys will say, well, that's the ravings of a preacher, sort of a religious fanatic. You know, you can't have a good dose of religion without people thinking you're crazy. You can't just take a stand for the right without folks thinking you're fanatical. That's always been so. I guess the Old Testament prophets, when they came to town and began to preach their messages, the wise birds said, don't pay any attention to them, and even the priests said it. They turned around and said, the priests said, we'll get us some prophets that'll say what we want to say, and they had their own prophets. The priests got their prophets to prophesy for them. For the old prophet of God took God's side in every controversy. And he was considered a fanatic. He was irresistible. He had power. You can't get rid of him. You can't get rid of God's man. You can kill him, but you can't get rid of him. You can put him in a grave, but uh, out of his grave, the seed of influence will spring up. You can't get rid of a man that belongs to God. You know, uh, when uh, they talk about John the Baptist, they thought he'd been raised from the dead, you know. You can't get rid of people if they're God's people. But you know, a man without God is a failure. Now let's notice this. It says a house can't be built unless God builds it. 
Now, God builds it if you build it for God. Anything you do for God, in the name and strength and power of God, God's doing. Now, God didn't come out here and lay the brick for this school. God didn't put the mortar down. God didn't plant the little shrubbery around here. God didn't do that. But if this school is built for God, for the glory of God, under the direction of God, then God built it. Now, you may have built your house. God didn't come out there and build a house you're living in. But if you didn't build your home for God, uh, it's not a permanent home. That's one reason the homes of this country are disintegrating. The divorce mills grinding. The homes in this country were built by people for themselves with human impulses, with God left out of the thing. And that's what's the matter with the country. That's the reason there's so much chaos. You know, men talk about building the house of business. Why, they don't know how to build it. There isn't a man in America today that knows the financial future of this country. It isn't possible to know. I was talking to Mrs. Jones last night, and I said, now, it may be, it may be that in this country we might have a period of prosperity. It might be. It might be a few years. Who knows? Nobody knows. It might be failure. I know one thing. If this nation prospers on the present basis, it's contrary to all the rules that I've ever known about business. But uh, it may be that uh, temporarily things might go on. Who knows? Nobody knows. Now, a man doesn't even know how to build a house. He talks all about the theories and writes books on political economy and everything else like that. And yet the whole story of the world has been the story of uh, wreck and ruin. Prosperity for a little while, then adversity. Financial failures, men don't know how to run the thing. And they think they're so smart. But some of them are beginning to realize now they don't know as much as they thought they knew. The psalmist knew all the time. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain to build it. And I said, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Watchman wakes up and says, I better look around. Why, you watchman, you can't keep the city. If a man builds it, you can't keep it from falling down. Something will happen to it. Someday an atomic bomb will drop on it. Last time I was in New York City, I thought about an atomic bomb on New York. You know, uh, I came down here by Augusta the other day over there, and yeah, where they're going to build that great uh, plant down there, whatever it is. Don't suppose anybody knows exactly what the development's going to be except the folks on the inside. And I said to Ms. Jones, I wonder if a bomb dropped down here would be big enough to reach Greenville if they ever drop one. wonder if it would be big enough to get up there. Why, you don't know what kind of bombs are going to be made. Man can wake up and look over the house. Who can tell what's going to happen? Who knows? Well, we know one thing. If God be for us, who can be against us? And the only people who are safe are God's people. Now listen to what he says here. It is vain if you rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. He said, go on home, go to bed. <laughs> Trust in God. Take a nap, get a little sleep. You can't uh, do it. You're not big enough to do it. Do the best you can and trust God Almighty. You know, it's a wonderful thing to have a big God, a good God, a loving God, a compassionate God, and to be able to call that God Father. And for us Christian people, we have nothing to fear. There isn't anything on earth that can hurt a surrendered, consecrated Christian man or woman. There's nothing can hurt you. It doesn't matter what comes. As far as you are concerned, you are secure. In God Almighty, the one that inhabits eternity, the one who condescends to dwell in the hearts of men who trust him. Now you have God. Now you Christian people demonstrate your religion where you live. Let's us don't worry, what do you say? Let's us go on and do the best we can, build our homes, plow our fields, make the best of business, but let's us rest in God. Now, when I say don't worry, I do not mean that you're not to have a burden. You should be burdened. You should be burdened with the souls of many women around you. In your heart, you should have a passion for lost people. 
You should be uh, zealous in the work of God. But you know, uh, you shouldn't carry the worry bird. The worry bird. That's the burden that's killing the world. The worry bird. Men die. Men blowing out their brains. Men committing suicide. The worry bird. You know, if you are surrendered to God, completely surrendered to God, you know, you can't die from an atomic bomb explosion unless God wants you to die that way. You can't die in a plane wreck unless God wants you to die that way. You can't die in a railroad wreck or an automobile wreck unless God wants you to die that way. If you're a surrendered Christian. Now, wait a minute. If you're a surrendered Christian, you'll use the best judgment you have. You'll use your eyes, you'll use your ears, you'll use what brain you have. A surrendered Christian's a sensible Christian. He's not a fanatic. He's sensible. He said, I do this the best I know how. The very best I know what I try to do. He doesn't run his car in a reckless way. He doesn't uh, ride in a plane just to be riding around. He goes in the plane on the way to duty or work. He goes along with the day in which he's living and uh, meets the issues as they come up. But he's secure in God. Now, there's no safety anywhere else. You know, I look out here at these young people in the school, and I thank God for their faith. It's a wonderful thing to be out here in the midst of them. They are looking into a future that they know is uncertain, but yet they have a rest and a peace. When I was over in Japan, I saw our missionary boys and girls over there and some other missionary young people and older people, the ones that had the old-time faith and the old-time religion. They had a sense of security, a sense of rest. Now he said, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. We can't uh, take care of the thing anyhow. We can't uh, build a town. We can't uh, erect the walls around the city to protect us. We can't do any of these things. But we can do something. We can take a nap, rest in God, go to sleep. Blessed is the man who in the midst of turmoil and strife and uncertainty can get down on his knees and pray to God, turn his life over to God and get in bed and go to sleep. You don't have to stay awake all night and worry. It's a wonderful thing to go ahead and rest in God, have a peace of God, the joy of God. Let's read these verses again. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain if you rise up early and sit up late and not be able to sleep, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Our Father, how we thank thee. We are not worthy of anything. But we do thank thee that by the grace of God we can call thee Father and rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank thee for this security. Nothing can hurt us. He that inhabits eternity is our Father. We do not know what's ahead of us. We do not know how long we'll be here. But we thank thee for the rest we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep us faithful to thee. Help all of us who know thee to dedicate our lives anew this morning. And if there are those who are not Christians, help them to trust thee just now. Hear us in this prayer and keep us faithful in everything. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.